Welcome to this online worship service at Christ Alone Lutheran Church in Mequon and Thienesville, Wisconsin. This is the third weekend in Lent, and the word zealous comes up, that God is zealous for his glory, and he's zealous for the salvation of souls. How we thank God for that. Let's worship him today, and let's begin by singing the hymn, Drawn to the Cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, look with favor on your humble servants and stretch out the right hand of your power to zealously defend us against all our enemies. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. God shows us his zeal for us as he gives us the law through the prophet Moses in the book of Exodus, chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone who, guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. We continue with Psalm 19. Thank you. 
Our second lesson today is the epistle from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, beginning at verse 18, words that will also be the focus for today's sermon. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Our verse of the day. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Our gospel for this day is taken from the second chapter of the gospel according to St. John, beginning at verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables, exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. We now confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's continue by singing the hymn, Forth in Your Name, O Lord, I Go.
As we begin our worship for today, may I offer this prayer. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock, our refuge, and our redeemer. Amen. We preach Christ crucified. Paul, if you're directing those words towards the members of Christ alone, you're preaching to the choir. I mean, look at the outside of the church. I don't think anyone in the community has a question about what our focus is here with the massive 20-foot gold cross on the outside of the building. We preach Christ crucified. And then you walk into church and anyone sitting in the pew cannot help but look behind me and see this 20-foot cross behind the altar. We get it. If anyone understands and appreciates the message of the cross, it's us. We've made it clear. We have displayed it boldly. The cross represents the place where God showed his greatest act of compassion on humanity by sending Christ to die for the sins of the world. But to the ancient mind, the cross was a vile, putrid Roman symbol of terror and political domination. It was not yet the old rugged cross remembered in hymns, embalmed in stained glass windows, perched on marble altars, or fashioned into jewelry. A quote from the historian of that time says, the very word cross should be removed not only from the vocabulary of the Roman citizen, but from his thought, his eyes, and his ears. The cross was the penalty reserved for the worst criminals. It was not humane or private. Instead, you were spread out, fully exposed, hanging on a coarse piece of wood. This gives us some insight into why the Jews thought the cross was foolish. They would have, you know, answered from Scripture, Deuteronomy 21 says, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. How could the Messiah be cursed? This could not be their Messiah. They had waited all this time. They had come all the way from the captivity in Egypt to the Promised Land, only for the kingdom to be attacked and taken into exile. God had still preserved a remnant, and this small group of people clung to the promise of a Savior. They made it through slavery, exile, military defeat, and becoming a mockery of a nation. For this? For a Messiah hung on a tree? This couldn't be. The Jews had a twisted view of what the Messiah was going to be. The Jews wanted signs or marks so they could distinguish the Messiah from other prophets. They were not looking for signs of grace and mercy but for spectacular signs from heaven, which would prepare the way for the Savior to become a great, mighty, political king. They dreamed of finally ridding themselves of these barbaric Roman rulers. Jews demanded God to verify his Savior with compelling proofs like he had done in their history. The sign they craved the most was a triumphant, mighty king, Instead, they got a cross. The Greeks, on the other hand, looked for wisdom, and they were famous for it. They wanted philosophy and systems of thought based on logic. Their philosophers are still studied in our days. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, and the list goes on. No names were more honored among them than the names of their thinkers. From the lofty heights of their culture, they looked down on all and despised all who failed to appreciate their wisdom. If you did not conform to their way of thinking, your ideas were unsophisticated and childish. So, a God dying? What type of logical thinking is that? If your God is ever-present, existing from the beginning, how could he die? That's not what their reason would say. They expected a divine being to have tremendous power and might. But your God, he's perfect, yet he's powerless? That can't be. 
we see both the Jew and Greek thinker in our day and age, don't we? We see those who demand evidence just like the Jews. God, if you're out there, the evidence of your existence should be empirical. How can you claim to be a God of love when I don't see your love in my life? I just see pain and evil. Prove it to me. Show me. I demand evidence. We also see those who seek an elitist knowledge like the Greeks. They say, God, I must be able to bring something to the table. I must be able to influence my relationship with you through the gift of wisdom and reason which you have given me. If I know more, I can find you and be made right with you. Then it hits you. That sounds like me. I am the Jew and the Greek. In moments of weakness, I say to God, show me a sign so I know it's you. Give me evidence. I seek with the Greek a knowledge that makes me more qualified to know God. My arrogant mind believes that my ability to think influences my relationship with God. And I demand from God that I can bring something to the table. I know that there's something good inside of me. I can do things to make myself right with you. How quickly our minds become fickle traps that take our God and attempt to place him and his plan for salvation in a box. We feel a need to mold him into the God which we desire. Take a moment and imagine this church building is your mind. Now, what if God was limited to dwell only in this church building? If God could only exist in this building, how great would he be? He would not be great. In fact, he would be the opposite. Instead of the boundless, timeless, grand God we know him to be, our God would only be as great as the finite, limited space. This is what happens when we make demands of God. We say to him, you must operate in this space of my mind alone. You can only work in ways that my mind can comprehend. A crucified God doesn't make sense. It's a stumbling block for all people because the cross is countercultural. The power in our society is a pyramid. Everyone wants to get to the top. If you have money, influence, earthly peace, then you've gained power. So wouldn't you expect the most powerful being to grace this earth to have a pompous entry? If you were looking for someone to defeat the reality of death and sin, wouldn't you expect an awe-striking being? Wouldn't you expect a leader with many followers? Instead, you find Christ humbling himself and going through complete humiliation. You find your God born in a manger, wandering in the wilderness with a small group of followers, tortured and beaten, ultimately bloody and bruised on a cross, a death fit for the vilest criminal. The question is not, why does anyone reject this? But why does anyone accept it? How can anyone look at the cross and see anything but a complete mockery? The answer is the Holy Spirit. When the waters of baptism cleansed us, the Holy Spirit was at work, welcoming us into the family of God. The Holy Spirit, through his heart-changing work, gave us faith to look at this cross. And this faith can see our Savior on a tree and know this is true power. This is true wisdom. Because what Christ did is unfathomable. He took the weight of the sin of the world and put it on himself, was separated from God for you and for me. He has made us right with God. This is the truth that those searching with human wisdom will never find. The sign-seeking Jews were blind to the significance of the greatest sign of all when it was before them. The wisdom-loving Greeks could not discern the most profound wisdom of all when they were confronted with it. 
The gospel transforms the cross from a symbol of Roman terror and, co- and complete political domination into a symbol of God's love and power. It shows that the power of God's love is greater than any human love or power. God had you in mind from the beginning, setting a plan to redeem you and give to you a not guilty sentence. It is true power and wisdom. In the cross, God has put both Jew and Greek, wise and foolish, trained and untrained on the same level. He has canceled out all human enlightenment on salvation or redemption. Your salvation is not dependent on how smart you are, how much money you have, or how much good you do. But rather, it is a gift that God has given you. God's message is simple. We were removed and separated from our God because of sin. But Christ conquered death, and in his saving work, we are saved. Christ crucified is the only way for us to be saved. Our Savior has shown us his true power. He defeated death with death itself. He has shown us true wisdom in a demonstration of his willingness to die the most shameful death alone and exposed on a symbol of Roman terror for us. And for us who believe, when we lift up our eyes and look at the cross, we see unmatched power and unparalleled wisdom because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. From the looks on your faces, I can see that a lot of you have lived this text already. You've experienced the mockery and resistance for your faith. People have looked at you and said, you donate money to a church? Why? There's so, much, so many better causes than a church. You're just being brainwashed. People aren't inherently bad. There's only one life. Just do what makes you happy. Christianity is so restricting. Why would you want to believe that? The Bible isn't authoritative. Why would you listen to a book thousands of years old? You say God inspired the word? It seems just like a bunch of guys wrote down what they wanted people to believe. It was just a power move. You face teasing and taunting like this for your faith. And I have too. I remember walking through the doors of my first ever general education class in public college. Being a shy freshman, I quietly walked to a far corner of the room and waited for class to begin. My teacher began, began with the basic syllabus introduction and then said, this year we are going to take a deep look into humanity. We're going to discuss your society, culture, and beliefs, and ultimately, I want you to question, why do you believe what you believe? As the year progressed, my professor began to push and pry my biblical beliefs. I quickly learned that my peers did not think like I did. The answer, well, the Bible says, was seemingly useless. Instead, I was a fool, my faith was foolish, and the cross I wore around my neck was repulsive to my peers. But I still have that cross. I still wear it. My peers could badger me all they wanted and call me a fool because I am confident in what they consider foolishness. And you can be too. We are assured through God's word that our Savior sacrificed his life for us. He became foolish to the world to save us. He became weak in the eyes of the world for the weak. He laid down his life on a cross just like this one for you. To those who do not believe, it is complete and utter foolishness. The Christian faith is repulsive and a stumbling block to those who do not believe. But we have a message that every heart desperately needs. We have the message that can fill the giant, God-sized hole in every heart. It is the message of the cross. And that is why we preach Christ crucified. Amen.
As Christ's church, let's lift our hearts in prayer. Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your means of grace, your gospel. Through this, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through this heavenly food. Increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Move us to pray for those in need and to help them with deeds of kindness. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ. As we pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is your works, not mine, O Christ.
We so much appreciate that you joined us for this time of worship today. May God bless your heart and your soul as you continue to grow in his grace and knowledge. We certainly invite you also to join us on Wednesday afternoons during this Lenten season when we live stream our worship service at 3.30 p.m. Central Time. Just go ahead and check on our website at ChristAloneWells.org for more information. May God richly bless you as you grow in his grace and knowledge. Proclaim. 